Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Brienne Foz. She's a professor of women and gender studies at Arizona State University, where she specializes in studying women's sexuality, critical embodiment studies, radical feminism, and political activism. She has a BA in women's studies slash gender studies and psychology from Occidental College and a PhD in women's studies and clinical psychology from the University of Michigan. She's published widely in feminist, social science, and humanities journals, has authored four books, Performing Sex, an Analysis of the Paradoxes of Women's, quote, Sexual Liberation, end quote, Valerie Solanas, a biography of author slash would-be assassin Valerie Solanas, Out for Blood, a book of essays on menstrual activism and resistance, and Firebrand Feminism, this is her most recent book, a book about radical feminist histories and their links to contemporary problems of sex, gender, and justice. So first, thank you for all of your excellent work. And second, thank you for being on the program. Thank you. So what what is radical feminism? What's where to come from and what's it about? So radical feminism as we currently think about it came about mostly in the second wave of feminism in the late 1960s and it was really trying to split off from liberal feminism by trying to think more radically. And by that, I mean not in an extreme sense as much as thinking about what is at the root structures of things. So radical feminists really differentiate themselves from liberal feminists by wanting to look more at the root structures of where things come from. So the roots of misogyny or racism or things like this. And that means thinking like in deeper and deeper layers of um, kind of bigger picture stuff, but also kind of digging into like where do these you know, things that oppress women come from. And so radical feminists split off from the National Organization for Women in the late 1960s and 1968. Um, they were having a lot of different discussions and conflicts about what feminist work should support. Um, a lot of their fights actually centered around Valerie Solanas, who wrote the Scum Manifesto, and at the time had shot Andy Warhol. And there was a group of feminists who believed that they should support someone who had been violent against a a man, not in a crime of passion, but because of artist rights and sort of feeling rage and things like that. They thought that would be an appropriate sort of, you know, form of feminist solidarity. And then a whole other camp of the of the National Organization for Women thought that it would not be an appropriate thing to support someone who had been violent or um you know, who had a history of madness and things like this. And so the the impetus for the split was this really sort of bizarre case of um, Valerie Solanas shooting Andy Warhol and whether that would constitute a feminist act. But as a consequence of that, then all of these different radical feminist groups sprung up in the late 60s in Chicago, Boston, New York City, L.A. I mean, it was kind of all over the place, um, trying to really think about, you know, in a deeper level what caused, uh, the oppression of women, and so they started things like consciousness raising, um, looking at things that had been really off limits in a in a feminist political sense um, prior to that, including in the first wave. So things like domesticity and people feeling trapped in the house and sexuality, the body, um, menstruation, you know, separatism, all kinds of different topics that really hadn't been explored before, and so that kind of started off. Um, the early history of radical feminism, which has had a kind of bumpy road since uh, with different kinds of resurgences and, um, you know, political successes and some would call political failures. And now we're releasing again the resurgence of a lot of radical feminist thinking, I think, in in the face of um, these very dire political times that we're living through. So that's that's kind of the short of it, although there's lots of different threads that we could talk about in there, too. Well, let's back up even a little bit more. And when you say second wave, let's talk about first wave for a moment. So so the um, the women who are struggling for the right to vote, would that would that be among the first wave? And Yeah, right. So suffrage, activism around suffrage is broadly considered to be the first wave. So that's, you know, late 19th century up until women secure the right to vote. And that it depends on whether you're looking at US history or more global, but if we look at US, the first wave, you know, that would be the main goal and it was a really it was a really precise goal. There was other things that happened in the first wave that were important, you know, thinking about things like um, women being able to inherit property and thinking about, you know, more kind of like financial security for women, women be, being allowed to be more educated, those sorts of things. Um, but these sort of, you know, these 
these more kind of beneath the surface things that were considered very private things, especially around things like sexuality and the body, were just not, they were not on the menu in the first wave. So then, oh, and I want to mention, so far as women not being able to own property, I remember when my parents got divorced in the early 70s, uh, my mother had a, was not able to get a credit card in her own name at first. Um, <laughs> right. It's, it's all, she had to provide, it was all absolutely extraordinary. She couldn't. I mean, an 18-year-old male would have an easier time getting a credit card than a than a middle-aged female. Yeah, I think people forget sometimes what it used to look like for women, even in the even in the late 60s, or actually even all the way until the 90s in certain legal senses. So, one of the most disturbing um, statistics that really, or it's not even a statistic; it's a policy-based thing, really is that there wasn't a law in all 50 states that prohibited marital rape until the early 90s. So I think if we're looking at some of these things, you know, in addition to all the financial disaster um, of women being treated as the property of their husbands, we also see women being treated as the property of their husbands in the sense of there wasn't even a law that allowed women to prosecute their husbands for rape in all 50 states until the 90s. That's I mean, we so build in this idea of women as the sort of charge of their husbands. Um, and that's, you know, when feminists were talking about this in the 1890s, you know, and to some successes and not. But, you know, the, you're right. The idea of women being able to apply for credit on their own, inherit property. Um, there were, you know, segregated want ads in the New York Times and in all the different major newspapers in the 60s even of jobs for men and jobs for women, and the jobs for women were mostly secretarial, um, you know, flight attendant jobs, that sort of thing. So, you know, the, the opportunities and the way that we just assumed that women were sort of designed to be in a service role or to, to be, you know, legally thought of as the property of their husbands is really a long history in this country. And uh, you mentioned men being in charge of women. That reminds me of something else. My My father was extremely... Uh, violent. He was very abusive, and he also was a doctor. And one of the threats he used to routinely make to my mother was that if she tried to leave him, he would have her committed to a mental institution. And he actually, to to prove this was possible, he had my mother's mother committed to a mental institution. And all it took was his signature plus the signature of one other doctor. And my father was an eye doctor. He's not even a psychiatrist. And yeah. um, so that was... Another thing that was not um, unheard of is for males, for 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 unruly women to be to be sent to to mental hospitals. And this was this was um, in the early '60s, late '50s. So this was also in the heyday of lobotomies, which is a, which is also you know certainly a terrifying thought. Yeah, and in that period, it was also routine and standard that men could call the psychiatrist, mostly it was psychiatrists then, but psychiatrists and psychologists of their wives and get updates. There was no privacy. That was a, that was a standard practice, actually, where, you know, psychiatrists, mostly male, would call women's husbands and discuss their treatment. So the idea that women have rights to themselves or a right to privacy or a right to make decisions on their own behalf or a right to financial independence or any of these things is really actually quite a new concept in this country. I mean, that's, we are really, we're really new to even thinking along those lines. And you can see the limitations and cracks in that story so vividly and like the recent, you know, Brett Kavanaugh confirmation and everything, all of the ways that, you know, women's you know, being believed and imagining their own narratives and that sort of thing is just, you know, attacked in that sort of way. I want to add one more thing to this, which is one of the reasons my mother didn't leave my father is because there weren't really battered women's shelters in the 50s and 60s. And so even something as both crucial and, um, I guess, commonly accepted as, as battered women's shelters, safe houses, those were... Uh, those are fairly recent institutions in this um, in this country. Yeah, and those are an outgrowth of radical feminist organizing. So I'm glad you brought that up because domestic violence shelters and child care 
were really huge priorities of many of these of these radical feminist groups. You know, they were seeing battered women and they were seeing abortion as these issues where, you know, no one was really dealing with it and they were considered, you know, private domestic matters that, you know, weren't yet really entered into like the public political landscape. And so that also led to this really crazy conflation of things. So one of the things that, that I was really struck with when I was researching and speaking with all these radical feminists about abortion activism was that when abortion was illegal, it wasn't just that women couldn't get abortions. It was also that when they got illegal abortions, they had to put themselves in these tremendously risky procedures. So, there, of course, there were, there were medical risks, but there were also other kinds of abuses that corresponded with that. So it was very, very common for women to be raped on the table when they went in to get abortions from these sort of, you know, underground doctors, some of whom were wonderful and some of whom were very exploitative and abusive. Um, there were raids on, you know, illegal abortion locations. And so sometimes when there were raids in the middle of when a woman was getting an abortion, she was she was just left on the table and often died from that. I mean, you know, these the risks of what happens, you know, when we start to think about, you know, Roe v. Wade going away or that kind of thing. I mean, it's I think we're we don't always see how there it opens up so many more avenues for abuse. And so, you know, the same sort of thing when women don't have access to things like domestic violence shelters, it leads to kind of a, a mandate that women remain dependent on abusers. And that's, you know, a really scary outcome, I think. And radical feminists were really interested in taking that seriously when they started doing all this consciousness raising. And women kept, of course, bringing up their experiences with battery, with getting, you know, abortions in these sort of underground ways and that sort of thing. So when you talked about a split between liberal and radical feminism, let's 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 leave aside Valerie Solanas for a moment and talk about what were the distinctions in the early 70s between the radical and liberal feminists what what was what was the actual in terms of organizing what was the the actual split were were the liberal feminists not interested in in uh safe houses for women or not interested in, I'm, I'm not really unsure what the distinction is well one of the big distinctions was that liberal feminists were very interested in policy change and usually working within the existing system to do that. So they were, you know, and again, that was their main goal. So getting things like um, abortion law passed, but in the way that would be the most likely way that it would go through now. The radical feminists wanted abortion law passed, but they were very, very nervous about basing it on the right to privacy. And so they thought that was the wrong premise upon which to base abortion rights, and that if you base it on the right to privacy, rather than arguing that women have a fundamental right to what happens to their bodies, for example, that then it would be open to erosion. And of course, that ended up being true. So the liberal camp was more like, we need to work within this existing system to get this passed as quickly as possible, even if the terms aren't, you know, great. And the radical feminist camp was much more like, we need to really dig down into this and think about what the root of this is so that we can base the abortion rights activist argument for passing legislation on something that has a more stable ground. So it, some of it, it's not that one was interested in policy and that radical feminists weren't interested in policy, but that that is one of the distinctions that tended to happen. But it was also that they wanted a different kind of thinking. So radical feminists wanted like a real sort of like legal base and premise for thinking about women as a social caste. So like what does it mean if we think about women as a sort of collective group and how do we sort of dig into these different issues in a different way than we would if we take as legitimate the kind of existing structure or not. So liberal feminists even now, right, are much more interested in working within the existing system to produce change. And radical feminists are more interested in sometimes sort of, you know, raising the whole system to the ground and like building from scratch or at least, at the very least, thinking in, in more sweeping terms about the issues that are that are at hand, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Um, oftentimes, if I'm interviewing somebody about, I don't know, prairie dogs or, or red wolves or buffalo, one of the questions I will ask is, so help the listeners to fall in love with prairie dogs. So what I'd like for you to do now is 
maybe name one or two of your favorite radical feminists from the 70s, Let's, and then we'll keep moving forward in time, but name one or two of your, your favorite radical feminists from the 70s and um, help listeners to know and quickly fall in love with them. <laughs> That's a great question. Well, okay, so one of my favorites is T. Grace Atkinson, who is a part of a recent book that I wrote called Firebrand Feminism. Um, and I just, I think one of the things that always strikes me about early radical feminists is what kind of risk they were really taking. I mean, these women were doing wild things like storming the offices of the Ladies' Home Journal and threatening the editor and, you know, demanding that they include more women and feature stories about women and had women editors and things like this. They got arrested at, you know, kiss off Nixon protests. They were, you know, they were just doing, you know, really interesting work all the time. And with T. Grace Atkinson in particular, you know, she had a habit of giving these really kind of wild and provocative speeches. So in, you know, in the early 70s, she gave a talk called um, Vaginal Orgasm as Mass Hysterical Survival Response where she's sort of, you know, laying out this whole program for why vaginal orgasm is sort of, a, you know, a tool of the man and, uh, you know, linked this all to, like, the history of the Virgin Mary. And she did this at Catholic University and was actually slapped by the sister. I can't remember her name at this moment, but she was slapped by the sister of a very famous conservative commentator who, like, in the middle of her speech walked up to her and slapped her across the face which then became this really, like, pivotal moment, even in things like, you know, communication studies and things like this. Like, what does it mean when someone is actually, like, physically assaulted in the middle of a speech because it's considered to be so offensive? And she, you know, had a habit of giving speeches like that a lot. And really, she wasn't just giving them in order to be provocative, but also she was trying to say things that really weren't sayable at the time. And so I love, I really, really love her as a sort of figure of early radical feminism. I also really love Florence Kennedy, who also had just a, she was a, an early um, civil rights lawyer who then became a radical feminist. Um, you know, she had worked on all sorts of cases with the Black Panthers. She actually ended up later representing Valerie Solanas as well, but she was fabulous. So she had a, a style of um, real, like, flamboyance and absurdity, and, you know, she would organize women to, like, pee on the Harvard lawn when, you know, Harvard University was blocking access to women. So, you know, she, she made all these women, like, join her at the Harvard to um, turn the lawn yellow because, you know, urine isn't so great for the lawn. So things like this. I mean, she, you know, was really into sort of, you know, theatrical stunts. She had a really great sense of humor. You know, a lot of the radical feminists, I think, really operated in these funny modes of being completely serious but also really funny and, you know, had a sense of solidarity of really taking risks together that I think often gets obscured by the more kind of liberal feminist histories that we know about more, right? So if we think about, you know, the history of feminism as people like Gloria Steinem and Betty Friedan, who were also very important, of course, we have a much more kind of tame version of what that looks like compared to what it actually looked like with a lot of the radical feminists doing things that I think you know, we we would find interesting if we knew more about in general. So, you know, whether it's all of their sort of absurd stunts, which were really wonderful and funny and smart, or their, you know, speeches, which were, you know, saying things that even now if sort of like blow your hair back, you know, they're really um, kind of take no prisoners women in that way. And, you know, it's really interesting when, you know, being in this day and age too, speaking with them, they feel like their perspectives are still very fresh and very, um, they just sort of, you know, can wildly leap between subjects when you're having a conversation with them, you know, between, you know, the importance of masturbation to why the New York Times is terrible, you know, you know leaping over to thinking in really smart ways about, you know, different policy issues or political issues of the time. And they can do that with such ease, you know, so they're pretty easy to fall in love with that way, I think. So... Two two things. One of them is about the the. I want to sort of put put some time context onto the vaginal orgasm question that or vaginal orgasm, orgasm statement that I remember. <laughs> this is embarrassing, but I remember when I was a teenager having read everything you always wanted to know about sex but were afraid to ask. You know that dreadful dreadful book that came out in the sixties, and. Right. 
I I don't remember much of the book because I read it when I was 14 or something. But but I specifically remember that author arguing that uh, orgasms from the clitoris are a myth. And <laughs> so this is the context in which, I mean, there's a larger context of, you know, several thousand years of patriarchy and also thousands of years of female genital mutilation and everything else. This is also part of the context in which she's saying that. Yeah, I mean, at the time, there was such a strong kind of Freudian, you know, mandate that basically vaginal orgasms were considered psychologically mature. And I mean, this is really sexist nonsense, of course, but at the time, this was really kind of, you know, pushed on women in very strong ways. And of course, now when we look at it, we can really see the ways that telling women that vaginal orgasms are super important over clitoral orgasms is a way of you know, normalizing heterosexuality, normalizing reproduction, you know, all the kind of traditional gender roles get wrapped up in that. But it also, you know, you know, the whole, all of the orgasm battles in general are really kind of revolving around this idea that women's sexuality is constantly being given various mandates for what it's supposed to look like and supposed to be. And radical feminists historically and now have been very resistant to that, you know, really trying to push back on, you know, every single thing that's supposed to be liberating and empowering and great for women ends up becoming this kind of mandate that women can't get out from underneath, so to speak. So it's a real problem, you know, and, and this is a very, very early moment of someone thinking about that. So, you know, T. Grace Atkinson's speech was, was a really wonderful example of that, of, you know, trying to, like, denaturalize the idea that orgasm, or vaginal orgasm in particular, is somehow superior and important in some way, and you know, and then doing all of this stuff where she's, you know, linking it to to other aspects of women's lives. So, yeah, I mean, it, I, for me, that's a subject that is always super interesting because, you know, it, it is to me a very political thing when you look at the history of orgasm and how it's been framed. And, of course, we don't like to think of it that way because it feels like this very intense, deep, personal thing. So, you know, it's fun when you take something like that and really, like, shine a light on, on the politics of it. There's even, I mean, there's there's a great uh, Harvard biologist who wrote a great book where she was looking at every single study that tried to figure out what women's orgasms were for and basically debunked all of them, concluding that there is no leading theory of what they're for and there is no leading, there certainly is no leading evolutionary theory for what they're for and that all of the ways in which most of these um, scientists, most mostly men, had been looking at women's orgasms was through very conservative traditional gender role kind of stuff around, you know, trying to make a story about something that actually the data didn't support. So it's a, it's a really fun narrative to look at orgasm. And, of course, you know, radical feminists, that's always on the menu. So I was going to ask you another question about Florence Kennedy, but you, you can't drop a line like um, – the history, the political history of orgasms is very interesting without me asking you to follow up on that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so we'll, well, put, I mean, we'll put Florence Kennedy on the, on the back burner for a moment. Sure, okay. <clears throat> Go back to that loop back. Um, I mean, the political history of orgasm, in short being that there was a lot of interest in this in the Victorian period where they thought that women's you know symptoms of depression and anxiety and, you know, hysteria, quote-unquote, were caused by the womb wandering through the body and, you know, being dislodged, and that the only way it could be reattached properly is for men to take their wives into these particular specialist doctors who would then use vibrators to reattach the uterus into the proper part of the body, and then women's symptoms would dissipate. So this is the early history of how orgasms kind of enter this political framework of, you know, kind of this bizarre doctor exploitative thing, but then, of course, this sort of hilarious way that people are assuming that they feel better because the womb has, you know, gone back to its right location and all of this. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes way back there. Of course, you know, there's lots of battles with Freud and Freudian thinking about mature and immature orgasms and then you fast forward to the sexual revolution wait 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 women's or yeah wait. We, we can also go further back of course to and we have we have thousands of years of female genital mutilation in yeah. 
yeah. in in patriarchy and the belief that um, you know sex is bad, women are bad, women are sources of temptation, women's sexual pleasure is either irrelevant or harmful. So we have we have this in the context of this whole larger um, uh, denial. No, it's worse than denial. Uh, de- demonization, demonization yeah. of of female sexuality and female pleasure. Right, and, bo- and like a real fear of it. You know, the, the use of controlling women through controlling their sexuality, that history is, you know, really almost like forever we have that history. So, you know, being afraid of women's sexuality. And, of course, this does differ for different groups of women and how this plays out. You know, certain women, of course, white women always are portrayed in this kind of like, you know, need to maintain purity kind of way. Women of color often are kind of assigned to be the, the servers of men's needs. You know, globally we see this play out in a really bizarre way. So you're right. This, I mean, the history of this is really intense. Um, but, you know, in terms of the scope of things that I've looked at in my own work, you know, if you look at the sexual revolution and things like this, it was really thought to be this big, you know, empowering, you know, thing to imagine that women could have orgasms. But it very quickly became a problem where, you know, if women did not have orgasms, then you know, you, that became an issue too. So you see these kind of epidemic rates of women faking orgasms popping up. And I mean, it's one of those stories that just shows you that, you know, when we try to imagine what is empowering, we always have to be one step ahead of that because it will very, very quickly be co-opted and used against women in, in very, you know, easy and swift ways. And so sexuality is one of those areas where you can really see that happen, where something is marked as empowering and then is very quickly co-opted either, you know, through corporations or through, um, you know, the, the right will take it and sort of use it against women. Or in this case, you see that something that's supposed to be empowering becomes yet another mandate or requirement, which then produces these weird things like faking orgasms and, and that sort of stuff, you know, or women feeling like they need medical treatments for their sexuality and that sort of thing. So, you know, it's really one of those things where we don't ever get to rest, right? We never get to say, we've achieved empowerment for women in this area, in in any area, really. It just, it's never, that's never a fixed thing. As soon as we declare that, we have to stay one step ahead of it, you know, through all the next series of co-optations and things like that. So I like thinking of sexuality in some ways as a metaphor of everything, right? It's like, you know... Sex itself isn't always terribly important, but if we look at it as a metaphor of the ways in which empowerment discourses are taken up and used against people, that it's really easy to see that way, I think. So anyway, I like to think of it like that. Well, I, I, I really love thinking about how when you, when, when those who are on the side of justice or whatever we want to talk about, fairness, um, figure out a way to, um, to to somehow stop some form of oppression, um, it's it's kind of like uh, that game Whack a Mole, where if you figure out a way <laughs> to stop one form of oppression, it morphs into something else. And one of the examples I always think of is how chattel slavery was, you know, outlawed by the by the American Civil War in the United States, and then it only took about ten or fifteen years for the Jim Crow laws to to get in place which in many ways were just as bad or in many ways worse. And yeah. then once they get rid of Jim Crow, then you've got the prison industrial complex and you've got other problems that it's like there's this underlying urge to, this, this underlying racism in that case, then is able to, like you said, co-opt or take any movement forward. So that's another thing that I've heard some radical, some very interesting radical feminist thought on how a lot of times we hear that, you know, the whole sexual revolution of the 60s was nothing but a wonderful thing and we got out of the father knows best of the 50s and things are so much, so, so great now and everything free love is wonderful. Um, but there are some really good radical feminist analyses about how that's not the case. I mean, that's not, it, it was, it was again co-opted. Do you want to talk about that at all? Yeah, I mean, and I see that in so many ways now, too. You know, you see the the Colin Kaepernick Nike ads, or you see, you know, college students saying that the thing they know the most about Angela Davis is the shape of her hair. You know, these are moments where we really see a kind of flattening out or emptying out of, of the bite of something and using it for, you know, selling things or, 
even selling the kind of packaging of the 60s, I think you're right that that um, we often have an idea about that that doesn't always turn out to be true. So you're right. I mean, you know, the cooptation stuff is really is really quite scary, and we I think you even see that kind of in uh, it's not you know it's not certainly not just a corporate thing or even a right wing kind of cooptation thing, but in the way that we like to repackage um, people who we might see as having dangerous ideas as more palatable. You know, one of the, one of the things that's really hard when I teach about because I teach a class on manifestos and the history of um, you know radical social movements and things. And you look at someone like Martin Luther King and you and you kind of imagine the way that we've repackaged him is such a, you know, sort of palatable character of, you know, really like the I have a dream speech is like this, you know, the pinnacle of who he is seen to be and we have this holiday for him and you know and he is really I think rightfully we could consider him a much more kind of radical and dangerous figure in a good way than we do, right? And so this this kind of co-optation also happens by trying to make things kind of like the feminism is for everybody packaging. I'm not sure that's really all that effective, right? And radical feminists have been really interested in kind of thinking about that, especially lately, about, you know, what does it mean if feminism is supposed to be pleasing everyone and for everyone and everyone calls themselves a feminist and everyone feels safe and comfortable by the ideas of feminism? We lose something, I think, with that of feminism, you know, drawing lines in the sand, for example, or imagining itself as, you know, a sort of menace in a good way sometimes, or a troublemaker. Um, so I don't know. That's a, that's a fight that keeps going on that, that I'm interested in following. But in terms of, you know, current radical feminists, you know, people like Jessa Crispin are writing about that sort of like, you know, I don't want to be part of a feminism that flattens out all of its edges and shaves off all of the, you know, kind of margins and makes it really, really safe and palatable and easy to digest. You know, that's not actually what we need. We need things that are a little bit more edgy and dangerous, especially around the theme of anger, which I'm really pleased to see, you know, is having a resurgence right now in ways that certainly in my lifetime I've never seen. So that seems really helpful and good. Um, but, you know, in terms of what that will look like in the broader scale of things, it's hard to say. Okay, I want to go back to Florence Kennedy now, and I'm, I'm, I may have the quote wrong. I may have the wrong person, and if I do, then we'll just ignore it. Um, isn't she the person who said that 90% of all oppression is consensual? I don't know. I've never heard that, but you might be right. I really don't know. Um, okay, well, we'll just, we'll just skip that then. Okay. <laughs> and go, and well, it is true in general that, that most of, uh, most oppression is, is us going along. They don't have gun, they don't have people with guns standing over us at every moment. We. Yeah, I mean, complicity, right, is such, I feel like if there's one word to me in the Trump era that I think about every day right now, it's complicity, right? Like, what does it mean? I, I mean, and this is also a thing for years and years I've always said, and, you know, when I teach students, it doesn't matter if you're smart, if you're not also brave, right? It doesn't matter. It does not mean anything to be smart and not brave because that will just be used in some ways for the wrong reasons and the sort of, you know, put into the wrong energies or the wrong outcomes, you know? And, like, bravery is the single most important thing I think we want to try to cultivate, like, in students and ourselves, you know, and, like, to to fight against the idea of complicity or just kind of going along with things, but... I think you know that sense of people complying and not and not fighting back. You know, really, we see everywhere. Um, you know, even with the idea of like kind of the, the ascendancy of fascism and things like that. So, yeah, I think we all have to be thinking about complicity right now every day. Um, we still have about 15 minutes left, so we're like two thirds of the way through, but we're still only in the 70s, which doesn't alter the fact <laughs> I'm going to ask you another 70s question. Um, sure. So, you know, when we think about the sexual revolution, w one of the things I was trying to get at, and this just does, is going to tie, sort of take us to the 80s too, and, and pornography, is that, you know, at the same time that sexual liberation is a good thing, um, it also, you know, Hugh Hefner was not, and, and, uh, oh, who's the hustler guy? Um, oh, Flint, Larry Flint. They were not unhappy with that, and they were really pushing it. So there's a, a a positive aspect of sexual liberation and then there's also an oppressive aspect that 
that was very ascendant. So can can we move forward to the 80s and and some of the concerns that were raised in the late 70s and 80s by radical feminists? Well, I mean, certainly, you know, the hazards of the sexual revolution, I think, are not a story that we tell a lot, but you can definitely see them playing out in that period, right? So you see, you know, a lot more attention to things like, um, again, so we see women's, you know, marital kind of rights being eroded. You see things like the Equal Rights Amendment failing in the 80s. I mean, there are some... The 80s were just a disaster, I think, in every way. But a lot of the the early radical feminists will say that they felt like their you know their groups that had formed in the early 70s and late 60s had in some ways like all dissolved by then. And so if we're if we're looking at organized radical feminism, the 80s kind of you know demolished that, and then it's had to kind of resurge in different ways, you know, during the third wave, and then of course now, which. I don't know. I mean, we may be on the verge of a, a new wave of feminism even now, so I'm not even sure we could call this moment that we're in now a kind of third wave moment or not. It, things do feel like they're sort of, sh- you know, changing in different ways. And um, But what we do see, again, like with the 80s, is that cycling around where you have these big bursts of change followed by periods of really intense regression, you know, and so it is always a worry that, you know, if we see a big a big surge of feminist activism or, or you know, left-wing activism even, that it will be followed by, and sometimes I think nowadays very closely, by, you know, conservative harsh backlash. And so the 80s, the 80s in feminist history is really known as a kind of backlash era. So it's it's not a happy time, <laughs> you know, for, for really liberal or radical feminism, quite honestly. So... You, your your most recent book is Firebrand Feminism, and you've you've talked about how important it is to you know you talked earlier about rage. So we have about ten minutes left. Can you can you spend a few minutes talking about the importance of rage, especially to women, and why we need firebrands, and what is a firebrand? Yeah. Well, okay. So firebrand feminism as a sort of concept means a feminism that's really not afraid of, again, its own edges and anger and rage and, you know, kind of outrageousness even. And so it's looking at what it means, especially in a historical sense, to try to look at the foundations that were laid in the 70s, the book is anyway, of feminism, right? So things around, you know, sexuality, love, the body, women as a social class, making an archive, tactics of activism, all these things. And then it's making connective tissue to now. So how do we use that or imagine that or think about that with regard to today and trying to make a kind of intergenerational conversation about that? And so, you know, specifically with the topic of anger and rage, this is one that I'm really interested in for multiple reasons. One, because I think it's one of those things that women are often socialized against, right, so that you know, being angry or being, rage, you know, sort of raging out is not often a thing that is validated for women as a sort of group, but it's also something that we know produces interesting outcomes, right? When women are allow themselves to be angry and then fuel that or channel that towards something, you know, related to activism, good things often happen. And so it's one of those tension points where I think people think that it gives feminism a bad name or looks bad for feminism if women are super angry, but I would argue the exact opposite. And so the book is really trying to think about that, at least in part of the book anyway, um, in more detail. Like, what does it mean to not shy away from um, some of the stereotypes of feminism that often we think of as scary or dangerous or off-putting even, and instead to kind of, you know, forge ahead, you know, headlong into it, sort of embracing those things and looking at that. And again, I, I am encouraged every day by the increase in that I see everywhere in women's, you know, public anger and um, that, you know, just watching the, the actual C-SPAN coverage of the moment that they were confirming Kavanaugh, the actual confirmation where women are literally screaming from the balcony in protest, that seems so important, you know, that it's, you know, women are not sort of just politely sitting in or you know, being, you know, behaving in ways that we conscribe typically as, 
you know, proper feminine behavior, that they're, that they're screaming from the balcony in every single moment and being hauled off by the police one by one, and that that didn't stop for the entire time. You know, there's also some narrative there that is really difficult that, we're, you know, it's sort of metaphorically very, like, rapey and terrible that that is also happening. But my point is, the anger is public now, and we're, I think we need to build on that and really draw from that. And so the book is trying to think about what, do we, what does a feminism look like if it's not um, a kind of milk toast feminism or a feminism for everybody or one that everyone might find palatable, but instead one that is full of difficult ideas or maybe dangerous ideas or, um, you know, collective really, you know, a reckoning, a sort of collective reckoning or digging down deep into the structures of things and what does that look like for, for all sorts of subjects that, you know, we also have thought of as off limits. So that's kind of what the book's doing, and I, I hope we keep doing that too, thinking about embracing rage and thinking about the utility of anger rather than distancing from it. I think I think that rage and anger are in, incredibly important, and I love I love the word outrage, you know, sort of a raging out, and at the same time, um, I know that there are, for example, there's there are some some anarchist theorists who argue for more or less random looting and burning um, because of, to use their words, the quote, carnival spirit that that it, it gives. And I am want to be really clear, I am not cautioning against rage. I think rage is, is great. I think the question for me becomes, first off, you know, especially as as someone who has been abused, and, and I'm saying this for myself and also, you know, for a lot of women, feeling the rage in the first place can be incredibly important. And then after that, the question becomes, how do you use it effectively? So I think, um, I, ju- I, I think about this a lot because I don't think that random looting and burning is, is, is an effective, it, it, that without a larger strategy, the keyword random, I, I think targeted, Burning is certainly a, 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 I mean that certainly helped win World War II. You know, bombing, bombing German rail lines, etc. So how does one once one feels the rage, how does one move to, uh, to use that? Oh, I want to say one more thing, which is back in the nineties, I did a talk and this activist came up to me afterwards who works on toxic issues in uh, Minnesota. And she said this line that has always stuck with me, which is, she said, sometimes it feels like the only things that keep me going are rage and sorrow. And I completely respect that. And I think that that's, that's, that still moves me to tears today. And then the question becomes, how, how do we use that to, how do we take rage and use that to stop rape? That's the question. Yeah, I mean, one thing to make clear is that certainly even among the radical feminists that I've talked to, they don't agree about what to do with anger either, right? So that's what I really love in some ways about, you know, talking with women who have very different perspectives who are all radicals but also all disagree with each other because then it helps us to kind of locate ourselves in their words and their thinking too. So, again, you know, sometimes there are certainly women in the book um, who think about rage and anger as potentially more destructive especially if not channeled properly than others. You know, others are sort of like rage is good even if it costs us things, it's good. Um, but I think a couple of things. One is it's important to think about that there there might be a sort of different sort of gendered approach to thinking about rage for groups of people who are sort of thought to be entitled to it versus ones who are not. Um, so I think in terms of this sort of public display of rage you know it can it can happen in so many interesting ways and i feel like right now we're at this really interesting crossroads of seeing the different options available to us right so you have and even with regard to rape activism or other things as well you have rage being channeled into a collective force of resistance you see that everywhere you have rage being channeled into kind of an embrace of the absurd which i think is actually one of i'm fascinated with that personally so you know, like this weekend, there's this massive, you know, hex going on of 
Brett Kavanaugh by all these witches in Brooklyn. I mean, that sort of stuff used to happen in the 60s and 70s, too. So there's this resurgence of absurdity or feminist comedy is on the rise, right? So we see, you know, when, you know, comedians like Ali Wong, who I'm just obsessed with, you know, thinking about things like sexuality and the body and these, and r- raging out and all these sort of interesting things. Or Hannah Gadsby, you know, who has this, this special where she's kind of almost deconstructing what comedy can do and by looking at it from like a sort of rage-based perspective, it's super interesting. And then you have, you know, rage being channeled into like individual sort of everyday forms of resistance, which is different than like collective stuff, right? So this is where you see people who are disclosing these events as happening to them or telling people about them for the first time or, again, in some cases, tweeting about them, which social media is not sort of something that I'm super excited about personally, but I can see the utility of that. So, you know, sort of publicly individual, you know, acts of everyday resistance, which I think can be useful. What we don't want, I think, and maybe that's what you're worried about too, is we don't want individual rage to lead to sort of self-destruction or burnout or you know, rage that becomes turned towards the self, right? Or turned towards, like, one's partner or something. Like, that's not always super helpful if it just kind of becomes this disruptive force of one's life that doesn't go anywhere that, that kind of, you know, can can be helpful to them. So I think we, we should be cautious about it. It's, you're right that we don't just want, you know, complete and utter, you know, burning down of everything randomly, <laughs> that sort of thing. Although I think, you know, again, when we look at who gets to feel these things, to me it's always a good sign when women are allowed, allowing themselves to feel rage because this is something that for so long has really not been an option. So, um, you know, there's that's a really long-winded answer, but I, I think that there's so many different, like, access points that we can look at for where rage turns into something useful or productive, I mean, whether it's creative work, you know, the absurd – into collective activism and organized stuff, into individual kind of disclosure stuff, into, um, you know, new new kind of, you know, access points to between people, between groups, between women. You know, there's there's lots of things going on right now that I'm hoping will lay a groundwork for some, a resurgence of some of the things that we've seen historically in the second wave that were really powerful. So we just have a couple minutes left, and what would you like to... Um leave women with uh, from this interview so one woman says to another I heard this great interview today and the other person says what was it about and what are we supposed to do with the information and what do you want women to to, to do well I think what the one thing that I would feel the most excited about is for women to really take seriously that radical feminism is for them right and to really look into what this history is and what it has to offer us now, I just, you know, radical feminism is often dismissed, as lots of things are, I think, for quite unfair reasons. And, and I am really excited about the idea that it feels relevant again, especially relevant at this precise moment. And we need certain things like radical feminism, I think, to survive what we're all living through now. This is a really hard time to be a woman. And so when we're looking for things of how do we get through this time, I... My argument always is we need radical feminism and we need to cultivate bravery in ourselves because and in each other because that's the only way I think we get through this. Well, thank you so much for all of your work and thank you for being on the program. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Brianne Foz. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. <laughs>